and welcome. Welcome to Global Connections. I'm your host, Carlos Juarez, and it gives me great pleasure today to, to welcome two young leaders who are joining us today from Mexico. Uh, they're two students, college students, who I'll introduce in a moment, and they're going to help uh, unravel and share some, uh, some good perspectives on what's happening in U.S.-Mexico relations, uh, also maybe some foreign perspectives on the U.S. elections as we've been going through uh, this uh, dramatic and uh, historic uh, set of events here these past few weeks. Uh, what does it mean from the outside world? And so we'll have some informed perspective there. And so joining me to be on it today, I'm very happy to welcome two uh, students. Uh, first of all, we have Carlos uh, Torres, uh, or maybe formally he's Carlos Francisco <laughs> Torres, Torres Morales, but we'll just say Carlos. Uh, Carlos, hey, thank you for joining us and, and welcome to Global Connections. Uh, I'll introduce, uh, I'll have you say a few words in just a moment. I, I also want to welcome our second guest, who is Max Figueroa. And Max is another uh, student, a college student in Mexico. So let me first begin with you, Max. Uh, tell us, uh, you know, briefly, where, where is it you're from? And you're, you're a student in, in Puebla, but introduce yourself briefly to our audience here. Of course. Hello. Good afternoon. Thank you for the invitation. My name is Max Figueroa, Maximiliano Figueroa. You can call me just Max. I'm from Puebla, Mexico, and I'm a student of the fifth semester of international relations at UTLAP. Hey, and that's the Universidad de las Americas Puebla, uh, the University of the Americas Puebla. It's a, a private university in Puebla, Mexico, uh, a very, uh, I, I could say, maybe globally connected university. These are two examples of Mexican students, but who obviously have a good knowledge and understanding of global issues, of the English language uh, that allows us to continue this dialogue. Our other joining us today, Carlos, uh, welcome to the show, Carlos. Uh, to where are you yeah. from? Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be uh, here with you today. Uh, my name is Carlos Torres. Uh, I'm from Miatitlán, Veracruz, Mexico, and I'm a student of the fifth semester in the Universidad de las Americas Puebla of International Relations, too. Well, again, thank both of you for joining me today. And, you know, I want to quickly just turn, you know, we, we've seen now in these last few weeks a, a very historic event, the uh, election in the United States uh, held November 3rd. Um, and uh, you are seeing it from the outside as observers, obviously, uh, as neighbors to the south of the U.S., uh, as students who are learning about, uh, you know, global politics and economics. Uh, and needless to say, it's been a roller coaster. It's been, you know, a, a confusing, puzzling. Even today, here we are two weeks uh, plus after the election, uh, the the, the loser has not conceded and continues to, you know, sort of challenge the outcome. Uh, but nonetheless, it, it is a transition happening. But more than that, let me begin. Maybe I just want to open first on some personal reflections. As you look back, uh, you've been watching this for some time now, like all of us. Uh, it culminated in the election, but we are still waiting for the final outcome. Moreover, as even Americans learn every four years, the United States has this rather peculiar indirect election of the presidency, right? And maybe just what, how does this, all this seem to you from your perspective? Maybe starting with Carlos, uh, give us a, you know, just some personal thoughts. Uh, what does it look like from your vantage point? Well, uh, for me, uh, the American elections is some sort of continuation about the, uh, about democracy and uh, the, this political system that the founding fathers uh, have implemented, uh, implemented since the beginning. And it is uh, something different that we do here in Mexico that, uh, when we vote here in Mexico, uh, basically you vote for the candidate you uh, you want in that case. But in the, in the in the case of the United States, you are telling your delegate who uh, which candidate you are telling uh, this person uh, your vote goes to. And in that sense, uh, if you are a voter of the Democratic Party in let's say Texas, in that sense, uh, if Donald Trump, the, in this case, at one Texas, the, the 50, uh, 50, well, the 50 percent uh, Donald Trump won, in this case, all the delegates go to Donald Trump. So uh, in that sense, for Mexicans, this is something uh, that seems unfair. And I can confirm that with some uh, people uh, who, who I have talked to. Uh, but yeah, it, it has been a roller coaster, and that uh, the United States is under this polarized system, and that uh, we thought that Joe Biden was going to win in uh, in this huge blue wave, and the Joe Biden and the Democratic Party it was intended to uh, dominate the elections for the Senate and the House. But uh, it is something uh, curious that. The Republican Party won the elections for the Senate, and in the case of the, the House, the Democratic Party even lost seats in that sense. So it is not quite what the what all people was expecting to be. 
in that sense. Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, like we did in 2016, the polls in some sense didn't get it right or they predicted some other outcomes that didn't play out. But in general, and you made reference to how voting maybe in a state of Texas or whatever state it is, but I would tell you at the end of the day, when Americans vote, they are assuming that they're voting for you know the individual. I think what you're explaining is that really technically what they're voting for is who are going to be their delegates from their state or who is their state going to send to the electoral college uh, and moreover it's a process that is still to be determined uh, even the senate while it looks likely that the republicans will keep the possible ma majority they have 50 today uh, there are two seats they're waiting to to determine in the state of georgia uh, you know it remains to be seen it, it could theoretically still go uh, to the democrats if they won both but more likely we anticipate they may not. Uh, so let me uh, turn maybe to Max again, some initial quick reflections. And then as we go beyond this, I want us to turn our attention a little bit more to US-Mexico relations. What does it mean? What does this election mean? But Max, uh, some some thoughts. Uh, what did you see in the elections? What did you find interesting or strange? Or what are your takeaways? Yeah, just like Carlos said, the election process here in Mexico is very different than in the United States. Here in Mexico, the one that decides the president is the popular vote. Although the in the United States are the election vote, and I don't know, I find I found this election very interesting, very dramatical, so so drama in in this election, because first one state said, "Oh, Biden is winning," but what's leading now? And I don't know, it was something very interesting, and I find it very dramatical the way that that the postures of the candidates were, I mean, Trump will never accept that he lost. He's still arguing that there's a fraud, that Biden will never win the election. And that's something that, I, that to me, it's still very, I don't know, like, I don't know how to say it. Like it's strange because I, I, I saw the another speeches in the past elections where the loser accept he's to lose and winner, but here we're talking about Trump. Uh, and I don't know, Trump is all a character. It's a very different man than all that we, you know. Yes, and of course, I mean, uh, we, we, let's, for that, uh, move our attention to basically U.S.-Mexico relations. And of course, Donald Trump, a uh, very controversial figure. Uh, he comes to uh, office, you know, when he accepted his, uh, or when he made his nomination speech uh, or his acceptance speech uh, to, uh, to enter the race. Um, he made a famous speech that was very critical of Mexicans sending rapists and criminals and the worst and all that, of course. And, you know, and he has been pretty tough on Mexico. As a result, you know, Mexicans have pretty tough feelings about him. Um, nevertheless, uh, it's been interesting to see over the years the relationship between Trump and uh, Mexico's president, Lopez Obrador. Uh, you recall a year and a half ago in the summer of last year, there was a lot of pressure given to uh, Lopez Obrador to control the flow of those migrants, uh, the caravans of Central Americans, and in many ways threatening the use of trade war, like ter uh, tariffs uh, increases. Uh, if Mexico did not cooperate. And what I want to get at here is right now we have a very hot and evolving issue in the news right now. Uh, very recently, uh, there was a, a dramatic arrest in, in Los Angeles of, of a former Minister of Defense, uh, General Cienfuegos, uh, who was the most recent uh, government's defense minister for the full six years, Enrique Peña Nieto. Uh, and he was arrested under, as I recall, charges of money laundering, basically drug re related. Uh, but more dramatically, uh, just in the past day, uh, the U.S. government essentially putting pressure on, on, on a, uh, I guess, has, has effectively released him to Mexico. Uh, and we don't have all the full details, but uh, the, what we know so far is that obviously the U.S. Uh, I mean, the government responding to uh, a request from Mexico to essentially let Mexico take care of it, so to speak. So this uh, individual has been let free of the charges. Uh, General Cienfuegos, a very high profile figure, um, but there's a lot of complexity going on because obviously the U.S. and Mexico have a lot of uh, cooperation that happens in areas, for example, security and, and you know, fighting the drug cartels. It's a very sensitive, very complex issue. Um, and beyond that, it's not common or normal that you have, you know, a former defenseman. This is the first time somebody of such a high level has been arrested and now let go. Uh, and I'm just curious, I mean, what is your take on it? What do you understand is going on? Was there some kind of deal made? What do we know so far? And maybe how, how is some of the analysis in Mexico today about this issue? And how might this impact relations between the two countries? Um, either of you wish to take it, maybe? Uh, uh, 
Carlos, any, any, anything you can add to this? Go ahead, please. Uh, well, uh, here in Mexico, uh, the detention of former defense minister Cienfuegos uh, is one of the other cases that has followed the, during the administration of President López Obrador, because in uh, when he was in, uh, made president in his speech, he said, and um, basically he challenged the establishment and said that corruption was not going to be tolerated in uh, from that moment. Uh, therefore, uh, the detention of Cienfuegos follows the detentions, uh, for example, uh, Emilio Lozoya Austin and Rosario Robles. And of, of the most important in, in the last year was a former uh, security minister, uh, Genaro Garcia Luna. And in that sense, uh, well, the, for the DEA, the the detention of General Cienfuegos was m maybe the most important in the DA's history because uh, they, it was uh, an investigation of a year, a whole year that the Trump administration was trying to uh, make a, a try to link the uh, the defense minister to the drug cartels and that basically the the, the the cabinet of President Peña Nieto uh, is accused of being colluded with the uh, of collusion with the, the drug cartels. Then, uh, when General Cienfuegos was uh, was arrested in Los Angeles, uh, the Mexican government and even President López Obrador uh, outraged and uh, it was furious for President López Obrador and uh, Foreign Minister Marcelo Ebrard because. Uh, the basically the Mexican government uh, wasn't notified about this and they didn't know anything uh, about this stuff. So uh, Marcelo Ebrard uh, tried to gather and to talk a bit, a bit with uh, Ambassador Christopher Landau. And well, in that sense, uh, it was a negotiation and uh, President Donald Trump made uh, and tried to press uh, uh, Attorney General William Barr, because uh, they they say that here in Mexico, Lopez Obrador uh, threatened to block a cooperation with the DEA and the United States uh, in that because well, Lopez Obrador was furious and it wasn't made in the in the framework of bilateral cooperation in security matters. So uh, now the now we Mexicans fear that General Cienfuegos is a will is more more likely to be exonerated, and that well, this is going to be uh, one another case. And that Marcelo Ebrard said that Cienfuegos is a free man. That is what he said in the news, and uh, there are some accusations of him being uh, so he was playing some role in the. Uh, in the murder of the 43 normalistas in Iguala Guerrero. Okay. No, well, thank you. I mean, I, clearly what it underscores, I mean, there's a lot at stake here. This is the highest level government official that has been on one hand arrested in the U.S., but now suddenly let go. And as you mentioned, uh, obviously it, it, it reflects when the arrest was made, Mexico was blindsided. They did not know. And, you know, looking back now, perhaps a, a more ideal situation would have been for the U.S. government to give them advance notice and say, hey, this is about to happen. Now, from the point of view of, let's say, the U.S. government, there is probably a reluctance to, to share that information, the intelligence, out of fear that it might have, uh, you know, made it difficult to capture him. Uh, anyway, very complex issues, but certainly it is, it's a breach of trust. And, and so the Mexican government responds very angry, diplomatic letters, uh, et cetera. And now, curiously, the United States, uh, President Trump and, and his attorney general, uh, Barr, have sort of weighed in to uh, allow uh, the charges to be dropped and allow this uh, you know, very high ranking official to go back. I am quite sure there are people angry all over the place in Mexico, here in the US, even some government officials in the US who probably feel that he's, he's now got a free ride. He's going back to Mexico, which has more questionable, let's say uh, criminal justice system and, and he may be free after all. Uh, on the other hand, for Mexico, this is going to be an inter interesting test. You know, will Lopez Obrador be able to deliver? Will there be actual uh, justice? Because I have to guess that if they had a one-year investigation and if they made a decision to arrest him, they must have some evidence. I don't think they would do this just, you know, without a sufficient uh, 
information. Uh, will they yeah. share that information with Mexico? Will, will it be possible? Well, we'll remain to see. Maybe the bigger picture is that we see now a transition in the United States from Donald Trump, uh, who even though the next six weeks are going to continue to be uncertain, uh, you know, what's going to happen. But assuming he will be, as I think we can, he will be replaced in January by Joseph Biden. We're going to see a, 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 a change in the Mexico-U.S. relations. And I wonder, maybe from your vantage point, uh, perhaps either Max starting off and, and what do you anticipate? What can happen? Does Mexico see Biden in favorable terms or is it going to be more difficult? Uh, what, what are some quick reflections on the future of U.S. and Mexico in the transition to a Biden presidency? Uh, Max, maybe? Yeah, well, for Mexico, I think that it will be something very good, very beneficial with a lot of changes in a good way. But I think, I also think that it will be hard to establish that relations between um, Lopez Obrador, AMLO and Joe Biden because we know and we saw the friendship that he established with, with Donald Trump saying that they're friends and we have the... Uh, um, the best treatment with each other. So I don't know how it will be started that, re that relation with Joe Biden. I, I consider that Biden will be more flexible in kind of of making the the right choose the, the right things and taking the right decisions. But it will be very interesting how see how the relation start and then evolve with Lopez Obrador. Because Mexico I consider that Mexico see with a very good eye that, that Joseph, Joe Biden is the new president of the United States. But the relation between Mexico and the United States, I think it will be interesting to see how they start and how they evolve. Yeah, and I know like every time you have a change, uh, there needs to be a personal relationship that develops and sometimes that takes time. Now, Lopez Obrador, the president of Mexico, is not known to be a globe traveler. Uh, he's only been to the U.S. Uh, the only time he left the country. And maybe I'm just getting at this. We're not going to see probably a lot of meetings, uh, but maybe that could change. Uh, um, and nevertheless, uh, those personal ties become important. Beyond that, there's a lot of speculation that, in fact, under Biden, we're going to see Mexico engaged more. But that is going to be more of a scrutiny, in other words, more accountability for human rights, for, you know, the violence and insecurity, maybe, uh, you know, for the corruption and so on. Whereas under Trump, more or less, Trump was not terribly interested in Mexican domestic politics. As long as the border was closed, as long as Mexico could do the dirty work on the southern border um, and obviously didn't renegotiate the NAFTA agreement, the U.S. was not too interested in what's happening. I think that might change. And maybe, Carlos, uh, if I can turn to you, I mean, what are your thoughts on, again, uh, with the transition to a Biden presidency, how this might play out in Mexico? Uh, what is some of the buzz or the thinking that you've, that you've seen? Yeah, and now that uh, we're taking some points that Matt said, uh, this is a big deal that Lopez Obrador, its very first visit was to Washington, to the United States, and that he said that Donald Trump and he, uh, him were friends. And... At this, uh, at this place, uh, during Mexico, uh, Enrique Peña Nieto term, uh, uh, Foreign Minister Jose Antonio Meade and Peña Nieto himself uh, traveled to some, uh, to some other countries, but Lopez Obrador is not known to be a, a president or a, a head of a state that uh, sees out of Mexico. And it is really a big deal that he's, he presented some support to Donald Trump. Now, uh, well, maybe in Mexico, and it is uh, something controversial that he he's one uh, or he's reluctant to accept and recognize Joe Biden as president-elect. Uh, but in, in this sense, I think that Joe Biden uh, maybe will, uh, and Lopez Obrador uh, must reach an agreement in migration. It is with Donald Trump that Mexico does the dirty work for the United States and Lopez Obrador, as we know, had a, an open doors uh, foreign policy towards, uh, towards the, uh, this, here this south of the, of the country. But now that Donald Trump basically said to Lopez Obrador, uh, please uh, solve that issue. Uh, I don't want uh, people coming in being big ways, big waves to, uh, to the United States, and maybe Joe Biden will continue some of these points uh, achieved uh, by Donald Trump and 
propose to Mexico, but maybe they, there will be some human way to solve this crisis and this migration crisis. Uh, and Joe Biden, uh, it is something that uh, maybe Joe Biden will take some uh, some position that seems to be uh, more of a peaceful relations to Mexico. And uh, but Lopez Obrador maybe will take some direct. Uh, uh, direct standing to Joe Biden, and then that is what we fear here in Mexico. Yeah. And let me all thank you for sharing that. And let me just add very quickly to some of our viewers that we have many who will be based more in the Pacific and Asia region. Um, the Mexico, uh, the current leader, um, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, he he's goes by his initials AMLO. Uh, he is a populist leader, like we see several in Brazil, another variation, and you know perhaps um, you know Donald Trump uh, representing it. And yet he's a populist from the left. He's a left-wing populist uh, who came yeah. to power with a pretty significant margin. And yet he also remains in his own way controversial. Uh, the fact that he's populist, he shares some traits with Donald Trump. He has a disdain for the media and constantly you know, challenging them. Uh, he, um, you know, he, well, he's, just, he's got some authoritarian, let's say, traits. Uh, but more to the point, now that they've been in office together, he's been there, uh, I guess, coming up on two years now, um, they have developed a, a relationship, even though now it's at a distance, but it's like a, you know, I like to give the analogy, maybe better the devil than you know, than the one you don't. And, and in the sense that Trump, they've worked out a, an agreement, okay, you know, we'll take care of that border, is, you know, just don't bother us anymore. I think that's going to be changing. And on one hand, with, with Biden, as you've suggested too, I think we're going to see more engagement and, and maybe uh, uh, the immigration question, for example, it's going to shift from being focused only on the security and maybe the law enforcement perspective of Trump to a more human security. So we're gonna see uh, this remain in Mexico policy where the you know, asylum seekers have to stay in Mexico and it's got a lot of attention, the conditions are not very good, that will be gone and they will be able to apply within the US and maybe more attention like AMLO to the socioeconomic conditions, economic uh, you know, underdevelopment, let's say in Central America or in parts of Mexico a more human security approach versus the you know, hard power securitization. Uh, but it's not gonna be easy. And beyond that, uh, we will continue to see. And of course, it goes without saying that the Mexico is such an important uh, country for the United States, uh, the large neighbor to the South, but you know, major, major trading partner, uh, et cetera. And similarly, but in a different way, the United States is so powerful and it's so important for Mexico, the leading you know, uh, economy and, and a very asymmetrical relationship. We always have to remind us that the United States powerful usually is the bully, usually pushes its way. And Mexico, unfortunately, has 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 that weaker position. However, and we can note this, um, you know, the recent renegotiation of this North American Free Trade Agreement, uh, now the US MCA agreement, uh, it gives Mexico an ability to have a playing field together with Canada to sort of balance some of that, especially on trade and you know, trade and commercial issues. Uh, and, you know, that's the nature of these uh, agreements. Uh, they, they give a maybe more institutional context. However, we will always see the bilateral relations. So the leader of Mexico and the leader of the U.S. will always you know, connect individually. Uh, and this is a again, it'll be interesting to see once uh, Biden does get into office. I will predict that fairly soon you will have some uh, meeting between them. Maybe it could be at the border or maybe, uh, you know, but, but somehow it is very typical that a new president in the U.S. or in Mexico, one of the first visits that they make is to, to say hello and have a formal meeting. Uh, we haven't seen that under Trump. Of course, he broke all the norms and traditions. And even AMLO, who comes to office uh, two years ago and prides himself in not having you know, either much knowledge of English, much interest in global affairs. You know, he's interested in fixing the house, let's say. Uh, but it has come at a cost, a lot of criticism that he's disconnected or and not aware. It'll be interesting to see how this uh, drama that we've talked about, Cienfuegos, you know, the, the crisis there, how it continues, because there is a very complex bilateral cooperation between Mexico and the U.S. on, on issues of, uh, you know, of drug interdiction. Uh, there are and have been for now more than 40 years, uh, 45 years, uh, a large presence in Mexico of Drug Enforcement Administration agents, the DEA and others, of course, uh, other you know, law enforcement, CIA and the like. Um, and they have to operate very carefully because Mexico is very strong and nationalistic and proud of its national integrity. And, and you have to be careful not to, you know, not to give too much attention to a foreign country. But 
the reality I can tell you, and you should know as young Mexicans, is there are American drug agents floating around Mexico, obviously trying to penetrate and infiltrate these criminal networks. Um, and interesting, uh, many years ago, I lived in South America in Colombia, where a, a similar relationship, of course, of U.S. Uh, drug enforcement agents. I can remember years back when the Colombians were arguing that just as the Americans have the right to send their agents into Colombia or Mexico, why, or, or no, they were arguing that it was necessary for Colombia to have some of their uh, police and officials in, in the United States, because only then could they penetrate the cartels, the networks. Uh, but the U.S. obviously operates with different rules. You know, we can go there, but you can't come here. So suffice it to say that, you know, while there may be some secret undercover Mexicans, you know, agents in the U.S., they're not there probably with the U.S. approval. They have to operate uh, separately. Instead, the U.S. dominant has this role. Well, let me maybe continue the dialogue here. And, and of course, it remains to be seen. But uh, I wonder if you can answer this question. Um, we've seen a lot of criticism and maybe uh, uh, understandably uh, alarm about Donald Trump in Mexico, as in many parts of the world. Uh, and that fuels a negative image of the United States. And, and indeed, we see from a lot of data and analysis that the U.S. has suffered a, a, a lot of you know, a decline in its standing and its image in the world. Um, but I wonder, do you think there is a distinction between looking at the United States as Donald Trump and maybe looking at it more from people to people or popular culture, music? I don't know. Uh, you know, many people in Mexico, for example, have family connections or, or maybe they have traveled or visited the country. And uh, I'm trying to I maybe ask is, do you think that some Mexicans can distinguish that, the leader and what he represents and the people, the society, the culture, whatever? What, what would you say about that? Uh, perhaps Max? Yeah, I will say that with the Biden administration, the Mexican people and not only the Mexican, the immigrant people will really feel that change in the in the kind of the ideology that Trump and Biden will manage, because the people feel identified with the populist thing, things that Trump has said that we are going to send into their home the the the, the migrants. We are going to make America great again, but I, generating a lot of hate to all the cultures, to all the different kind of people. But with under the Biden administration. And I will consider that they will really feel the, the change in, in, in the um, perspective of a most humanitarian way. And I don't know, I will think that, uh, yeah, we will be seeing, able to see that change. Okay, and maybe uh, here as a final thought, Carlos, uh, uh, and some final closing thoughts on that. Uh, do you think there's a, an ability to distinguish between Donald Trump or, or you know, other parts of American culture and society? Uh, yeah, uh, for me, uh, Donald Trump, and it is uh, something curious that uh, even Tong Amlo has a good relation to Donald Trump. Mexican people has a, a low and uh, an image of Donald Trump being a populist and, uh, and the enemy of Mexico. But maybe it, the changes in, in migration and these issues, uh, basically that Mexico has, uh, has struggled with insecurity in the border and that migrants are the, the basic receptors of, a, well, victims of these drug cartels. Uh, maybe we'll see that change uh, for Joe Biden in the Joe Biden administration. But uh, I think that in Mexico, the the general public isn't aware of the changes that maybe Joe Biden is proposing in foreign policy. And, and yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, thank you for those remarks. And, uh, you know, it's helped us to just get different perspectives. I appreciate that. And I think at the end of the day, look, you and I, all of us, we're passionate about, you know, global issues. Most people are not, but we need to bring it to them. And this program, this opportunity to share your perspective helps inform our listeners. Uh, and I really am grateful to, to hear these insights. Um, the United States and Mexico are very important uh, neighbors and, and very complex relationship. 
Uh, but I'm pleased to see that you as young uh, Mexican leaders, obviously you have a good understanding of these issues and, and you know, curiosities to learn about it because uh, the fact is as neighbors, we're never gonna go away. We have to work together uh, and that uh, requires us to you know, dig deep. So let me thank both of you for this opportunity to share your thoughts about uh, these issues about the US elections, which can be confusing, not just to foreigners, but even Americans. We, we, every four years, we, we have the same problem. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, it, it's a process that uh, affects not just the US, but even Mexico. So the outcome of this election is important for you as well. Uh, so let me close on that. Thank you again, both of you, for joining me here on Global Connections. I'm your host, Carlos Suarez, and uh, we'll close on that and look forward to the next one. Thank you so much. Aloha.